to order, if you would please join me in a moment of silent prayer or reflection. Thank you. Martha Jo, did you roll Alan Warren. Here. Kathy Cox. Pat Rooney. Here. John Nasden. Here. Nicole Cohen. Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're going to call for our budget hearing. Arizona Revised Statute 15905-01 uh, of our 2017-18 expenditure budget, and I will turn it over to Mr. Murray. <clears throat> Madam President, members of the board, the district must adopt the 2017-18 budget no later than July 15, 2017, and file the adopted budget with the Mojave County Superintendent and Superintendent of Public Instruction no later than July 18, 2017. The proposed budget summary was posted on the Arizona Department of Education website on June 28, 2017. In accordance with ARS 15-905-A2, Districts that maintain a website must provide a link on their website to ADE's website where the district's proposed budget summary can be viewed. Districts must also email the school finance budget team a clickable link to their webpage where the link to be where the link to be proposed to the proposed budget was placed. A copy of the email and a screenshot of the website will be retained in the file located in the district's business office. The full proposed and adopted budgets are kept on file at the district business office and in the governing board minutes and are made available to the public upon request. The attached summary pages are provided as background for the, public, for the budget hearing. Thank you. 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 No comments? I'll just say the presentation was outstanding. I agree. Okay. If there's no comments, we will move into the next agenda item, our call to the public. Do we have any calls? Okay. And we will now uh, do a recognition of visitors. We're going to have Brad Gardner do an update on the NT3 grant. I think that'll make Mr. Board very happy. <laughs> and just for the audience to say, uh, for whatever reason, we can't get the screen working this evening, so you do need to use the back screen. Okay, <clears throat> update on the grant uh, that we, we did secure this past year. Uh, the NT3 grant is the Network of Transform Teaching. Um, again, the whole purpose of this grant is to help us in retaining teachers, uh, providing them support as first and second year teachers to develop our mentor pool eventually, which is what we believe causes us successful in teaching. Um, <clears throat> most of the districts that have applied for the grant the grant have received their letter of notification of they they earned. And we're still hopefully going to get our award notification within a week. That's what it's called today. So we have not received that. <clears throat> when we organize our team, um, you have to submit a plan. You have to have eight members of your team available um, during the course of this, uh, this grant. So our superintendent is our, is our lead on this. Myself, um, Jamie Festa with the National Board Certified Teacher, Denise Miner with our 
first of all, to Mark and Michelle, you said our grant specialist. This is the oldest thing that the National Board of Certified Teachers, so it's known as Seth Lane, so it's known as Hockey. That's our team. So far, what we've done with this grant is we offered pre candidacy classes, and we pre candidacy for eventually people who are interested in becoming National Board of Certified. So the pre candidacy, these are, again, these are not mandatory by any means, it's just an opportunity to develop. We had 10 participants, and we will again in the fall uh, offer more pre candidacy classes and we will provide support for all three of them. But we did have 10 participants. <coughs> what the grant consists of again, it's one year, we received $70,000 in funds, hopefully, we will receive that soon. 5% of Christy Olson's salary plus benefits is included in this grant. Uh, we were able to purchase a technology, a camera, and a tripod for the grant, which we use for um, professional development. We're going to purchase these books and resources, the five core compositions, professional learning plans, and the adventure, excuse me, architecture, accomplishments, and posters. And then we have travel where teachers who are pursuing National Board certification. One of the reasons that they will be pursuing this more so than ever is because we're paying for a lot of the costs involved. So in September, I believe, okay, sorry about that one, we have 25 staff members committed to National Board candidacy already. And of those 25, I, have, I know 20 personally that are committed to attending the first weekend in September to start their, their candidacy. That's in Phoenix. Again, that grant helps us pay for the cost of that. And normally, teachers fund that themselves. They're responsible for their own, their own costs. Uh, we, currently, we have 12 National Board certified teachers in our district um, from Mojave County. That's unheard of. So we're very proud of that those accomplished teachers that have done that. We had 10, again, completed pre candidacy in April. We have 25 staff members starting this school year that are committed to becoming National Board certified. <laughs> That's a one to three year process depending on um, how they approach it. They can either get the entire thing done in a year or they have a three year period to, to work on. We'll provide support along the way. Um, we have support meetings starting each month and we'll start those in August for those that are interested. Questions? I've got a couple <laughs> questions. Uh, my understanding was that this first grant was for $100,000. Okay, remember we have two. We have the master teacher and then we have this one. This one is the second one we applied for and we secured that. The other one that you're referencing is that, that we already have that as well. Okay. But I'm not giving you an update on that one. I was just giving an update on that. this last one that we just secured for pre candidacy purposes. Okay, second question I've got is I knew that we had this last year or the year before and it, we didn't go beyond the first level. What I'm wondering is, is there a redundancy in our purchasing of cameras and tripods and equipment? Not that I'm aware of, no. Michelle and I have gone through the actual grant and what we've allocated for purchases, so we, did, we were more efficient in that area. Okay. And will you give us an update in the fall as to how these candidates are doing? Yes, and I'll also give you an update on the budget and what's been spent and over that three-year grant that we, we secured, we'll, we'll follow up with that as well. Okay. And I was, was recommended that in my <coughs> director's uh, minutes to the board that we put out monthly that I'll include updates on the grants as well. That's fine. I just, I just want to make sure we're keeping track of it and the public knows what we're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? Thank you very much. Do we have anybody who's going to do an update for the Lake Havasu City Education Association? Mm -hmm. She did it? Okay. All right. I think Carol's in Flagstaff, so. She is. Okay. All right. We will move uh, on to action item 4.1, approval of consent agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Martha Joe? Mr. Madison? Yes. Mr. Rooney? Yes. Mr. Ford? Yes. Mrs. Collin? Yes. Okay, old business. Uh, 
5.1, second presentation and review of revised policies EFDA, collection of money and food tickets, and JL student wellness. Mr. Murray. Madam President, members of the board, it is recommended that the board approve the second presentation of revised policies EFDA, collection of, food, of money, food tickets, and JL student wellness. No changes have been made since the first reading on June 20th. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions? Discussion? Mark the chair. John Baskin? Yes. Scott Rooney? Yes. Alan Ward? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Item 5.2, second presentation and review of revised policies EEAG, EEAGR, student transportation and private vehicles and EEB Business and Personnel Transportation Services. Mr. Marine. Madam President, members of the board, it is recommended that the board approve the second presentation of revised policies EEAG, EEAG-R, Student Transportation and Private Vehicles, and EEB Business and Personnel Transportation Services. No changes have been made since the first meeting on, July, on June 20th, 2017. Thank you. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions? Discussion? Alan Ward? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. John Nasden? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Moving into new business. Action item 6.1, approval of expenditure of insurance proceeds for fiscal year 2017-18. Mr. Martin. Madam President, members of the board, it's recommended that the governing board approve the expenditure of insurance proceeds during the fiscal year 2017 and 18. According to Arizona Revised Statute 15-1103, this action is required to expend insurance proceeds which the district may receive in connection with insurance recoveries. At this time, we do not know what, lo what those losses or recoveries may be. However, this action prepares the district for events that may occur. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions or discussion? Mark the job. Alan Ward? Yes. John Mastin? Yes. Pat Brady? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Item 6.2, approval of disposition of litigation proceeds for fiscal year 2017-18. <coughs> Mr. Murray. Madam President, members of the board, it is recommended the Governing Board approve the disposition of litigation proceeds during the fiscal year 2017-18. According to Arizona Revised Statute 15-1107, this action is required to expend litigation recovery proceeds, proceeds which the district may receive in connection with litigation recoveries. At this time, we do not know what those recoveries may be. However, this action prepares the district for events that may occur. Do I have a motion? I make a motion we accept 6 2 as written. Second. Any questions? Discussion? Pat Rooney? Yes. Alan Ward? Yes. John Mastin? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Item 6.3 approval of approval to adopt the expenditure budget for 2017-18. Mr. Murray. Madam President, members of the board, it is recommended the Governing Board approve the adoption of the total budget for the fiscal year 2017-18 in the amount of $50,806,144. Per Arizona Revised Statute 15-905, the Governing Board must adopt and send a copy of the adopted budget to the County School <coughs> Superintendent no, no later than July 18, 2017. The total aggregate school district budget limit cannot be exceeded unless through a revision. The $37,406,732 budget limit is for maintenance and operation, classroom site, and district additional assistance categories. Please review the attached summary for an explanation of the budget figures. Thank you. Do I have a motion? I make a motion we accept it as listed. Director. Any questions or discussion? Uh, Mr. Murray? Yes. I had asked a question at the work session. Uh, in regards to the budget, uh, regarding programs that were, were being retired, new programs that were coming online, did you have a chance to research that? Not fully. 
just because of the fact that we're trying to get this uploaded to the state. Uh, but I can get, if you can give me specifics as to what programs. Well, I mean, things, things change every year. And, and I guess where my concern is, is that, is that we, we all have our favorite new program that we bring online. But I'd like to know where those offsets occur in the budget. What did we decommission to bring on one of those new, new uh, programs, one of those new spending initiatives? Because in, in the maintenance and operations budget, it's not really program-based per se. It's, it's more salaries, benefits, which take 85, about 85 percent of that budget. Um, well, where the programs 15. might be would be more in the tax credit or student auxiliary section. Well, but I'm, I'm looking more in that 15 percent that's, that's left over because there are parts of that where where we're bringing in a you know, testing assessment and a new, uh, uh, classroom initiative, say for third grade reading or something along those lines. Have, have we maybe changed any of that this year? I, I haven't budgeted anything that would take out any existing program or add any existing program that, that I can see. If it was based on the money you received that we qualified for from the state and allocated accordingly to address salaries, benefits, supplies, those types of things. Mm -hmm. I, can, I, can, I can tell you that there's been some cost saving um, strategies put in place and some, some uh, looking at some things that I brought up in, in the work session or in the, the budget proposal session uh, where we are looking at to cut costs where, where we can. For example, in, in our waste services, uh, we, we were able to um, basically offset that by around $10,000 annually just by looking at our current, uh, our current needs and what, what we were currently servicing uh, in our schools by way of the number of, of dispensers to or receptacles to um, the frequency and, and, and the trash pickup service. So we're looking at, at many things, but as far as programs like reading programs or those, I I haven't taken anything out, nor have I added anything. So we're basically programmatically within the school, we're running about the same on the education side of things. But we are looking at uh, facility cost and how to keep our facility cost uh, under control and actually lower it. But trying to reduce them, that's correct. And any new programs that would come or typically come by way of either special services or, or curriculum. adopted budget meets the requirements of the 1.06% teacher increase for 2017-18. Mr. Murray. Yes. This one's kind of lengthy, but I want to make sure I read this one very carefully. Okay. Take your time. <laughs> Madam President, members of the board, it is recommended that the Lake Havasu Unified School District Number 1 Governing Board attests that the 2017-18 adopted budget meets the requirements of the 1.06% increase. Senate Bill 15 or 1522 provides for supplemental teacher pay for 17 and 18. Arizona school districts shall increase the salary of each teacher who taught at an Arizona district or charter school during the 2016-17 school year and will teach at an Arizona school district or charter during the 2017-18 school year by 1.06% based on their 16-17 salary, which includes stipends and classroom site fund Prop 301 payments. This shall be in addition to other salary increases that the teacher would have otherwise received during the 2017-18 school year. Districts have been instructed that only teachers paid through Function Code 1000 are eligible to receive the 1.06% increase. Function 1000 includes the activities dealing directly with the interaction between teachers and students. Certified staff who are identified in the USFR as offering support services in Function 2000 or any other function including attendance, guidance, health, psychological speech and audiology, OTPT, academic coach, and teachers on assignment 
unfortunately are not eligible for the 1.06% increase as defined by the state and Auditor General's office. <coughs> Monies that a school district receives from the 1.06% increase and related benefits shall be included in the school district's general budget limit. District governing boards are required to attest that the adopted budget meets the requirements of the 1.06% increase and attest to the information provided regarding the 1.06% increase through a separate vote. The calculated increase presented today is an estimate, an estimate amount based on the data currently available. A revised budget will be presented to the board with finalized figures prior to November 1st, 2017. The district's business office has notified teachers of the scheduled date and time of this action. The current plan is to either make one payment to teachers in December or perhaps split the payment into two, one in December and another in spring 2018. A public hearing was posted to the Arizona Department of Education on June 28, 2017, and a link was also posted on the district's website. Thank you. Do I have a motion? Make a motion we accept 6.4 as written. Second. Any questions or discussion? Statement? 1.06% is not enough. But it's a start. Yes. Um, I wrote on, on my personal Facebook site, I said kudos, and somebody got after me about saying kudos to the state for, for giving 1.06%. Our state, to my knowledge, and I've lived here a while, has never put any money directly in any teacher's pocket. This is at least a recognition that we have a problem, this is a start. I also took some time, and I don't have the underlying data with me, to run what it would actually take for the state of Arizona to bring every teacher in the state up to the national average. You would have to take the entire state budget and take 50% of that and tack that onto the back end. That's how far we are behind as a whole in what we pay. So when I look at this, I see a good initial first step. There's got to be steps behind it. So I think we should be thankful for the state that they did something. But it doesn't mean they're out of the woods. It means they got to do more. Um, I just think that we are just very blessed to be in Lake Havasu City. Mm -hmm. And after the passing of the override bond, that was the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. The 1.06, like John said, is not enough, but it is a start. And I just think we're just fortunate that we have our city backing us right now. And that's what's important. We can't rely on the state. We've got to rely on our hometown city. We're a local school district. Yeah. I agree. <clears throat> and I'd also, uh, also like to take it one step further and point out that when we're talking with our legislators and when we're talking about the funding formula, <clears throat> it would also be good for us all to educate ourselves on our state land trust and uh, the lack of dollars that are coming into our coffers because we, we're not making the revenue off of the land that the, that the federal government is controlling and that money is supposed to directly go to fund our public schools. So I think we really fail when we don't mention that and bring that into the conversation when we're talking about funding. But today, I just wanna say how happy I am that our community has supported us and um, that we were able to, that the team was able to put together such a fantastic compensation package for our teachers. And again, I yes. concur, this is icing, and I think everybody's been recognized and worked hard together. And, and now we just need to work hard to be really transparent with all of our taxpayers and prove ourselves so that uh, they want to do it again and again. So. Well, aren't the uh, trust lands separate from the federal lands? Trust lands have already been given to the state. The trust so, lands so are the, separate. The fact of the matter is, uh, those trust lands that have been given to the state, uh, you have uh, uh, a board that is responsible for doing that. So I'm not trying to confuse it. I was not talking I about the trust be, lands or Prop 123. I'm that, sorry. But that is, uh, you know, to go ahead and put those together because those trust lands 
uh, are under the control of the state, and so whether they lease them or sell them, uh, it's their responsibility to be good stewards of that gift. I'm talking about the, the federal lands, okay. which is uh, over 44%, I believe, of mm -hmm. our land in Arizona that is not managed by our state land trust and that is not public land, so, or private land. And yeah, that is what we're losing out on. Sorry, because thank you for... Those are already there for... Right. And, and, and I thought I said federal land, but if I said time. state land trust, I apologize. Okay. okay. So, if there's no other questions or comments, go ahead and call for the vote. John Nesman? Yes. Alan Ward? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. Nicole Collins? Yes. 6.5, approval of IGA between Crane Elementary School District and Lake Havasu Unified School District for the purchase of Crane Elementary Dynamic Curriculum. Mr. Burton. Yes, this is Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, Mr. Gardner and I do have a presentation. If uh, the board would like to see it, I'd like to introduce the item first. Uh, it is our recommendation that the governing board approve the IGA between Grand Crane Elementary School District and Lake Havasu Unified School District created to purchase the Crane Elementary Dynamic Curriculum Strategies. <clears throat> the cost is estimated at $7,500 for 2017-18. And as a um, prerequisite to Mr. Madison's questions, this has been budgeted out of the Instructional Improvement Program uh, funding, which is also referred to as in-game gaming, since it's specifically for improving and instruction. Thank you. The rationale, um, basically the State Board of Education, as all of you are aware, have adopted newly revised Arizona College and Career Ready Standards for Mathematics and English Language Arts. These were adopted in December of 2016. These standards are to be fully implemented by 2018, and the AZ Merit Assessment will be aligned to these new standards by this time. In addition, new science and social studies standards will likely be adopted in the very near future. We're anticipating probably within the next year. The Havasu Unified School District will fully implement the new language arts and mathematics standards and use this 2017-18 transition year to provide requested and needed support and professional development to our staff. Crane Elementary District's dynamic curriculum strategies will assist our district with this transition to the revised standards and provide us with a fully vetted and aligned resource that will provide teachers with valuable insights for planning their curriculum resources and instructional practices. The curriculum is defined as the resources used for teaching and learning standards. Our district actually controls the curricula that are adopted at a local level. The curricula are what we use, I'm sorry, I have to, are what we use to teach the standards. The standards are what the students need to know in a and be able to do by the end of each grade level. Standards built across grade levels in a progression of increasing understanding and through a range of cognitive demand levels. Instruction is the methods used by teachers to teach their students. Instructional techniques are employed by individual teachers in response to the needs of the students in their classes and are based upon the identified standard and selected curriculum. Part of the reason that we included this in the, in the backup information is that what we are asking for the board to approve is the purchase of what Crane calls a curriculum, but what is actually a standards map. And so we'd like to present some information to demonstrate what that is. What Crane has done is use full-time release language arts and mathematics specialists. They've taken each of the standards by subject and grade level. They've identified the skills required for mastery in each. They've identified the grade level standard below and below and above that links to the progression in learning. They have identified the common misconceptions that students and teachers experience when teaching that standard. And then they've identified the cognitive level or rigor required in order to demonstrate mastery of the standard. In addition, each standard includes short aligned formative assessments that may be utilized to see where students begin and end in their understanding after teachers have taught the standard. This allows each teacher to approach the teaching of the standard from the same basic understanding of what it means to actually have a student learn the standard, which will be especially useful to our teachers who are new to the profession. Crane's resource will enhance our district's curriculum and support one of our goals of retaining teachers by providing them with the information they need to be successful in the classroom. This curriculum strategies process will also assist our district in providing a comprehensive resource 
that will enhance our current curriculum and meet district-wide needs. All of the resources are available in one platform and are easily coordinated with the existing units and lessons that have been developed by our teachers. The platform, ATI, is one that we currently have access to but have not utilized as a component of our Galileo system. Teachers and principals have called for a streamlined, comprehensive curriculum tool integrated with assessments rather than having to search various folders in order to locate all of the available resources. Crane's development of this tool in one platform will assist us by providing a system to which we can add all of our existing resources and thus streamlining the lesson planning process and the district-wide alignment of resources. This would allow our teachers opportunities to teach strategically while teaching them, saving them much time in terms of instructional planning. And this contract has been reviewed by our legal services. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay. Before I start, I just wanted to reiterate the importance of retaining teachers. Uh, I was asked to write a letter of recommendation this summer for Erin Epler. Um, she's applying for a position back east, and she was a National Board Certified Teacher. I worked with her directly as a principal over Lord Grande, and then she offered to leave because we're struggling so much with retaining teachers because of so many reasons. So she was recently hired, I believe. Um, There's one of our incredible teachers and another district in this graph. So again, going back to the idea of retaining teachers and the grants that we applied for, these are all positives and we're passing the over over and on, things are starting to look better for our, our district. Anyway, since I've been the Director of Educational Services, when I came over here, the first thing that I was introduced to was the, the, the standards for games. Within two years after that, then we were charged with common core standards, so we had a tremendous change there. And within that time period, then along came PARC. And then after that, we were adjusted from PARC, now we're back to the Arizona Revised College and Career Ready Standards. So in six years, we've gone through a two-year period over time, where we've changed everything. And it's very frustrating, because you're providing training, you're trying to secure the resources with very little money, and then all of a sudden it flips, and you have to start over, and then people leave. Um, so you provide all of that training, and then it, and as a result, you have to basically get back to the square one. So I'm hopeful these are actually, these new standards that we have are Arizona standards. I'll do a presentation in the near future in the fall about the newly revised standards. Diana Douglas traveled throughout the state and actually got public feedback on those standards. Um, experts uh, from across the state joined in, so I do believe we actually have a set of Arizona College of Areas and we can all be proud of. But that said, um, what this, this, uh, this opportunity So this gives you some continued background. Uh, the ELA and Mathematics newly revised standards, they were adopted in December, just past December, by the State Board. Uh, social studies standards, new social studies standards are actually being worked on right now in June. They're supposedly going to be released this year along with the new science standards. The newly revised standards are to be assessed and they'll be aligned with the Arizona or the uh, Arizona Merit Test in 2018 and 19. So basically we have a year, a transition year, to prepare our teachers to understand fully what the newly revised standards are and what they are what they expect students to be able to do. So that this year is basically a transition year for us. Prior to 2015, the ELA mathematics standards were paced by grade level and content area, so we developed a curriculum map for each grade level, ELA and math and social studies and science. I had a group of teachers work on these over the course of the summer over the last four years, and they basically unpacked these standards so that they identified what students really needed to know and what teachers had to do to present that information. So we had units of study, they were all aligned in the standards, that not all of the standards have been addressed simply because of the resources we don't have and the time. Right, that's an issue. All of the resources that we have created are located in folders on the All Shared Drive. All of our teachers know how to access those, but again, they're in different places. 
Um, but one of the things that we try to focus on is trying to give teachers more time. That's what I've been told repeatedly by teachers. We just need more time, Brad. We have a lot on our plate. We just need more time to plan. So we've tried to, I started um, horizontal and vertical articulation meetings to help in that area. So they, people started to work together as teams and, and they're planning. But anyway, they were, they were brought together to identify the standards. They were to identify how students will demonstrate they have learned the standard, identify the curriculum material that will support the content knowledge, and then the instructional strategies that will engage learning at that level. And we call this backwards design. Um, we hope teachers have a shared understanding of the standards and what they, what, excuse me, and what they need is essential. And the curriculum again here is standards driven. It's driven by the state. They supply us with the standards. They were adopted, so that's what we teach. Um, this again, however, the structure allows us to control our own curriculum at the local level, so we decide the resources and the hows and the whats. That's based on our decisions. What Crane has offered, is, again, it's, this is not a curriculum, it is simply a platform to house <coughs> their strategies that they develop. They've also addressed the newly revised Arizona standards, which are much more rigorous than the previous standards. Um, any curricula that I've looked at is extremely costly. A lot of it is canned. It's just reinvented, and, and it's a way for corporations to make a lot of money off of the backs of educators. So I've not pursued any of that. <coughs> Cranes is not any of that, by the way. It's simply a resource and tool for teachers. All of their information, which is unwrapping of the standards, as Diana read to us, is located on one digital platform, so it's easily um, navigated by, by staff members. And they have unwrapped every single standard, including the newly revised standards, and they, they also will include eventually the new social studies and science standards. It will provide them with a wealth of knowledge in one location, including resources on how to teach a specific standard and how to address common misconceptions. You now, just my own personal experience as a former teacher, when I walked into my first classroom in Green River, Wyoming, I was given two textbooks. I was told to teach sophomore English, freshman English, creative writing, and science fiction and fantasy. I came out of college, I had no idea about science fiction and fantasy. I'm like, what? And I was supposed to teach this. And I wasn't given any guidance on how to do it. I had to basically create my own curriculum as I went through the year. And I started on day one and said, okay, I guess I will try this. Things have changed dramatically. Most teachers do not have to experience that anymore. Um, you're usually given a resource right away, and you have these standards that help you understand what you're supposed to teach and when to teach it. Again, so this is what the goal is from this, is it gives us the, the resource. The teachers aren't hunting and pecking and trying to find things we actually now have a place where they can go and there's specifics on how to do something and the resources are available. Diane? So what we have, uh, the next few slides are some screenshots so that we can illustrate what it is that we are looking to acquire. This is an example of what Crane calls a unit. And this is a math unit description what it actually is, is a description of the standards, the domain, the cluster, the rigor components, and the critical area of the standards. So for praying, uh, you see a suggested duration of 10 days. This is grade level 5. So some of the teachers in the room could actually do this better than me. Uh, this is number and operations fractions, standard 1 and standard 2. Okay, so the first number is the grade level. Then it tells you what the standard is uh, in terms of the category and so forth. So that standard is to add and subtract <coughs> fractions with like to unlike denominators. There is a cluster within the standards that this addresses. And what they provide also is the rigor. So the rigor in this particular standard is to build conceptual understanding. We use real world problems for application and develop fluency. When we talk about rigor, the three levels of rigor are conceptual, application, and procedural. So one of the things that's important is that, that fluency, that procedural knowledge, that practice, of, that automaticity in the mathematics skills is a part of all of the different standards in the level of rigor. Then this identifies the critical area of this standard, what it actually looks like. What they have 
have, and part of why I wanted to show this slide next, is they have a um, opportunity for formative assessments for every single grade level, starting in grade one through grade eight, because this is only a K-8, for a very short formative assessment. So you can see this sample is for that same fifth grade standard. There's a little 10 question, and then there's a little eight question form B, which could be used either as a pre- or post-assessment to see where the students are, or it could be used as a post-assessment and then a re reteach and reassess kind of a format. But there are very short little standards. Sorry, my aunt's following me from my office. <laughs> anyway, uh, so these are Google assessments. These are optional. They're not required, but they're available within. But what I wanted to show you on this screenshot is it's all in one place. So the page that we just looked at would be under the unit information. Then I'm going to show you some pages that are coming out of the standards, and then the materials, and then this would be the assessment one. If you click on this assessment info, then you actually get some additional information. So again, it's optional. But what this does then is shows the actual um, guidance on what the assessment looks like, and how do you recognize proficient, it gives an example of question and the answer. And it also shows you that this is a multiple choice question at the depth of knowledge level one. So this one is a selectable text depth of knowledge one. And it gives a chance for teachers to see what would that actually look like if a student in a fifth grade could master the standard. So that is a resource that's available by one click. Then when you click on the standards tab, you have some information about the standards. And they do talk a little bit about the standards for mathematical practice. And so while we have the actual content standards, the, the um, skills that the students need to know, the conceptual standards, the um, mathematical practice standards, apply to every single standard throughout the mathematics. And so in this particular case, making sense of problems and persevering and reasoning abstractly and quantitatively are the two mathematical practice standards that are applying to that standard. And then what they provide here are some questions. So for the teacher who doesn't know how, or especially for those beginning teachers who don't really know how to do into those concepts with students, here are some questions they could ask in their classroom should they choose to use them. And they can use those in their time. Then we have in there the standard progression by grade level. So when you're teaching this concept in fractions, it might be important to know that in third grade, this is what they were supposed to have learned, how to understand a fraction. Then by fourth grade, how they have um, the equivalency. And now we have unlike denominators, and next year they're going to have to be able to compute the quotient and interpret and compute the quotient subtractions. So you can actually see how that learning is linked and why it's important that that essential learning is taught at that grade level and what prerequisite skills students need to have. So if you gave a pretest and they couldn't master it, you can go back and look and see what were the prerequisite skills that we need to teach with this standard. And so it shows this for one and two as the example here. <laughs> then this feed is simply the page before. We saw third grade understanding of fraction. Here's what that really means. So for a person who does not have perhaps the depth of mathematics training as a teacher, they can actually read this and get a little bit more information about the content. Or if they don't need it, they don't have to. Then we have the rigor component. So I mentioned the three components of rigor. What this does is identify, in order to have students have conceptual understanding of this, they need to know to be able to do these things. For procedural understanding, they need to be able to do these things. And then for application, there are some examples as well. So this is really pretty specific. As an example, it says, understand that denominators tell the size of the parts, and having same size parts makes adding and subtracting fractions easier. So that's a conceptual piece of uh, adding uh, unlike denominators. Then there's a tab that identifies all of the terminology for that standard. And so what are the big terms that students would need to learn? And there is uh, information there that they can link to. <laughs> and then there's a little bit of information in terms of the way we teach fractions. And one of the interesting pieces here is they tie the mathematics back to the language arts. There's another place where you'll see this as well as an adjective noun being 
And then if you want to go deeper into that, there's more information uh, for the teacher as well as a resource. Then what they provide here are questions, stims, and prompts that you may want to use while doing the lesson. So these are the things that can take you to those deeper levels of understanding and that address the, uh, the conceptual versus the, the uh, fluency versus the application. Thank you. Then the other thing they provide, again, these are all things that are, are linked through a click, is examples and explanations. So for um, if a student's not getting a concept, there's some more uh, depth of information here that you can continue to scaffold into. And then, this one is a little wider than the screen, the, um, the tab that says materials, I believe, is the one that you can get to that will actually show some instructional strategies and provide some pictures and videos for the teacher to see what does that look like. One of the areas that is, uh, I think, personally very helpful, and I don't know how elementary teachers would feel about this uh, in terms of mathematics, but there are common misunderstandings that students have in mathematics that some of us who learned math learned it one way and wouldn't know how to address. And so one of the things they talk about here is that oops, you may have to have a little bit of review here of equivalent fractions, but one of the things that is a common misunderstanding is that when we're doing fractions and students are asked to model them, they often mix models. So they'll take a, a circle and divide it into thirds, but then they'll use a box to show fourths, and the circle and the box really aren't comparable, they're confusing, and they cause uh, um, misconceptions for students in the process. And so, so this talks about what are some of those misconceptions and how do you help to not have those happen in your classroom. And then the other thing they talk about, which uh, I realize that a lot of us like to use, are some of the tricks to get to an answer. And they talk about how harmful it is for some of those tricks to be used, because students can do it, but they have no idea how it works, which then interferes with later conceptual understanding that they need to gain. So yes, I can do that. I can get you the answer, but, I, but if you give me two things that are unlike, I still can't figure out what to do with those. The next thing they do is they provide information about how this ties to our blueprint, and consistently they look at uh, the current grade level and the grade level below. So um, when we're talking about um, the domain of operations, algebraic thinking, numbers, and base 10, Here's what they were looking at as far as percentage of, and it's a very similar percentage here in, in the fifth grade. But you can see here, measurement data geometry changes, so they get a chance to see that this is going to be more emphasized this year than it was last year. Then we also provide the descriptors here of what is <clears throat> the definition for when a student is proficient. So when you look at your student's performance, how do you determine how they might be scored if they're minimally proficient, partially, or highly? This does this for the fourth grade, the grade level before, and then for the grade level that you're in. <coughs> what this also includes are samples of assessment items that were taken from the AC Merit, from the PARC, from the SBAC, just to give a variety of what assessment might look like. And then also some samples of mathematical tasks that you could use with five links. So if someone was interested in a task for using equivalent fractions, there's, you could click on the, start of the um, problem that's a measuring cups problem. So students could begin to use them. So those are available as resources and examples of what resources would look like. So the big thing that this would do for us is it allows us to have this work done with consistency for every single standard, for every single grade level, and then allows us to begin now to look at when we're planning, okay, so we now know what the standard means. We agree at whatever elementary, whether it's not true or have a student pie, I'm going to teach your fifth grade, I know what the standard means because we have the same definition, the format's the same above and below. 
And now it allows the system our time really planning what are the experiences we want to have with those children to create those experiences. We're not trying to gather information for ourselves first. And that's essentially the strategy of this tool and the fact that it is on a platform that is navigable. So when you saw the, the tabs up there, it had materials, or I think it was materials that was on the tab. So we could actually link all of our units so that when you click on the materials, all of the units that our teachers have created for that grade level and that standard would be available in, in one place. And that was huge. Um, again, on the money and time issue, the, uh, one of the things it does is gives us the standard base. If we're looking at developing our own district curriculum committees and starting to look at a subcommittee, we can all be starting on the same page of, okay, this is what we need to teach. Let's talk about how this curriculum actually fits or doesn't fit with this particular standard. Uh, one of the things that I would like to mention as well, and this is something that isn't necessarily uh, something we have public discussion about, but in, our, in looking at our assessment results, and I don't want to say that, that one test on any given day defines us, because it does not define us. But we have seen a trend, particularly with mathematics, um, at the middle school level, where at the eighth grade level, our students are not performing well. One of the areas that, and I did not discover that someone else was looking at it carefully and analyzing it, says, well, you know, for, for however long, the way we've always done it, if we've taught the high school algebra AD class at the eighth grade, and then they go into ninth grade algebra one, or, or whatever we call it, or for the advanced level, they take algebra one at the eighth grade. But what is happening is our students are not getting the eighth grade math standards. And so one of our tasks for this year was going to be to take all of the eighth grade math standards, unwrap them, identify and do all of this work on the eighth grade math standards for our middle school teachers because they're going to have to do that work this year in order to start next year. Our commitment is that starting with the 17-18 school year in mathematics, eighth grade math will be the eighth grade standards, which is the foundation for algebra, for geometry, etc., and not the, the algebra AB course that they would have had at the high school. So that's one of the areas that kind of prompted us looking at, you know, what can we do to save ourselves time and money that would run as a resource? That's it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Uh, where's Crane Elementary District? Where is that? In they are in Yuma. So they put all this together and then they in turn can sell it to different school districts? That's so, yes. So what happened was they, uh, they've been doing this work for a couple of years and uh, they have a lot of money. I, I'm sure it's because of a number of reasons. And well, they're titled. Uh, and they, they, they're big titled. They streamlined this for this purpose. They took all their money and put it in this book. Put it in that. And, then to, and then get it back by right. selling it to so other districts. What, right. So what they're doing is, um, this is the first year. It's still sort of a beta year. Uh, they presented their Title I conference at the invitation of the Arizona Department of Ed because it is such a solid program and it has been a couple of years of being vetted. And they're, what they're doing is um, allowing us to utilize what they've created through the same platform. We would own the information to date. So the, all of that standards and wrapping, all of that, that would become ours. To continue membership is when you get the update. So everything, I mean, they're paying all these people to continue to update, to add to it, and so forth. So what we were looking at is this allows us to set that foundation, not have to replicate all of this work. It gives us the basic for all of the standards. Um, looking at perhaps a two-year commitment so that some of that work that they're paying to have done at the uh, social studies and science level will be ready for us. Being able to bring our curriculum in and then actually have a format that we can now do this with our 9 through 12. Because we don't have the 9 through 12 done to the degree that the system done here. We have similar to what we have right now at the elementary, which is the majority of them are, are unwrapped and have units, but the format may not be exactly the same. They may not necessarily be consistent in the information they contain, and they're not all easily located. So we pay for it maybe for two years and then hopefully develop it in-house. Yeah, out, expand it, yeah. Expand. Because this foundation work, as long as the standards don't change again, sure. that foundation work is done for us. That would be I have a couple of problems. I'm going to support you on this because <clears throat> I trust you and our teachers to teach these kids. But the problems I have, I told you before about partnerships. The partnerships, you can quickly wind up with the tail wagging the dog. Now, you say a two-year commitment, but I will guarantee you, I'll put it in money right now. At the end of two years, 
when you have something being provided for you that you don't have to use your own efforts for, you're going to continue it. That worries me. The other thing that worries me is it's easy to explain this in mathematics, but they talk about misconceptions here. When we start getting into history, English even, there's a lot of areas there where what they call a misconception, we may not call a misconception. And it worries me that we may wind up following their lead on things we don't want to follow. But like I said, I'm trusting you and the teachers to stay on top of this. But I can see some deep pitfalls in this. I'm going to echo what you said as far as, as the history and the English side of things. I think this is going to be a permanent fixture, I think, for different reasons than what Mr. Ward is, has indicated. The state of Arizona has gotten into this bad habit of revising everything every two years. I think we make a two-year commitment, we're going to find that they've changed something that we're going to need help with in two years. Uh, my other concern is the staff. I mean, have we talked to staff at all about this? So, actually, no. We did this presentation to our admin team, to our principals. Mm -hmm. And part of this came out of the issue of just not being able to find things, how are we going to develop some sort of a platform to put everything on, um, looking at the lack of consistency and where the gaps are, in just the work that we have that's a resource to teachers. And so, uh, what our plan was to do is to talk with principals. Some of our principals did talk to staff. I, can't, I don't want to speak to that, but we didn't roll it out to staff. We asked the principals to share it as they needed it. And look at it, writing it as a resource for planning that, um, that would then be the springboard for additional work that our teachers could do without having to recreate or go back and backfill some of the areas that we have. The, um, the other issue, and again, I, I share this, is we just in looking at, and, and we'll see this when we present our results, some of those were in so I didn't want to talk too much about them, but um, we don't necessarily have consistency across grade levels and across schools. So we may see that when we look at, we would expect to see, we can visualize, you know, looking at people's results by grade level, all of our schools kind of follow the same pattern based on the quality of what we have as content, but we see some where there might be a grade level that's becoming very low at one site and very high at another site, which does indicate there's some lack of consistency either in the understanding of or implementation of these standards. And so one of the things that this does is it starts us all on the same page. So, so if I understand the answer, we have an issue where we may have disparate curriculum or disparate understanding of the curriculum at various school sites. Um, the spirit understanding of the standards. Standard. Okay. The yeah. other thing that bothers me too is with this, with these examples they're giving us and everything, is it becomes very simple to say, that's the way you're going to teach it. And new teachers get, that's what you're going to do. And I'll just use an example. My students used to hate doing division. And one ninth, if you want the decimal, you divide nine into one, you get point one 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 one. I used to tell my students, well, all you have to do is memorize your one fractions all the way down. And then eight ninths is point eight 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 eight. Seven ninths is point seven 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 seven. And you don't have to divide anymore, all you have to do is multiply. Now I am sure if I taught that way in one of these schools and they had been operating off of this system, I would be told that's not the way we teach that here. And that worries me. And, and I think what I would say is this is, as you saw in this example, this is simply information that teachers can use as a part of their planning process. Um, I didn't hear this quote, but basically what I was told was said by one of our teachers is, you know, typically I have four different documents out that I'm looking at while I'm planning my lessons. What this does is put it all on a screen and I can click and come through it. Um, it's information that is available, but it's, it's not intended to be telling people how to teach a standard or, uh, or what curriculum to choose. However, it does have that basic concept of this is what it looks like for a student to master the standard, because this is the level that we're being held to. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm simply saying 
we have to keep in perspective that what looks so wonderful to us today can morph into something totally different two or three years from now. I don't disagree with that. I, I think that the I came in today with a lot of misconceptions because we've heard a lot of chatter and teachers, we all chatter, they, everyone's chattering, okay? So in hindsight, I think um, just a suggestion would be is if you did bring some teachers on board who have looked at this, who went, this is, because now that I see this, I'm excited. Um, but you don't have any teachers on board and, and so right now you've got a lot of scared teachers who are, what's gonna, what's Brad gonna tell us to do when we come back to school? I don't, I don't see it as, it's completely different from what I heard it was, and I tried to talk with Brad a couple weeks ago about it too. Um, the thing I'm really excited about was um, the formatives. And I know you didn't mention this, but we have a lot of kids coming in with gaps from the grade levels above. Mm -hmm. I personally, when I saw those formatives, I looked at it and went, you know what, I would love to take that fourth grade formative for that same standard, give that as a pretest to see where my kid, if they're coming and missing those standards from fourth grade, mm -hmm. so we've got, we've got, yes, so I really like that, um, the, um, the rigor and the questions and the prompts that they gave us, I see that as very valuable to brand new teachers, because a lot of times, they don't have those skills yet. They don't know those questions. So I really like that. Um, question. Pacing guide. Does this come with the pacing guide or do we use what we have now in our district? That's a good question. Um, they have already lined it up by quarters. However, we are not planning to use their pacing guide. Okay. Uh, we have a pacing guide. Um, yes. What we would probably do is, as we use this, uh, is look and see. Do we have any any questions about what we're doing, do, is there a reason they chose to pace them the way they did? There are plenty of schools in the 1718 using our pacing guide. Using our pacing guide right. this. So um, the standards are the standards. Okay. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, I, I'm excited. I think it's great. And I think if you get show a couple of teachers at each school who get on board with it, um, I don't think, I think teachers will use it. The other thing I wanted to say is we do the verticulation in the horizontal meetings. And at the very beginning of the year, usually when we meet with our grade level across the board, I feel like um, sometimes they're very valuable. And I think that would be very valuable if we could have more of those. Um, so maybe once a month in those meetings, maybe all the fifth grade teachers could get together and talk about that with the new teachers and you bring your ideas. And that way, again, we're closing that gap because we have a very transient school district here. We get kids from all other schools. So just a suggestion that would be good. And fifth and sixth grade to be separate. I'd just like to address some of the questions that we've had and concerns over here too. Uh, mainly because uh, she did state that we're going to add our own units and lessons which we have already created. I know that our ELA has PowerPoints, it has all sorts of things that are available to teachers to use. They don't have to, but it is a way of teaching it. Um, so those will be on the same site in the same way. The other thing that I noticed is that several years ago we were working on proficiency scales, and when we did this under a math grant, it was phenomenal, the increase that we had in our, um, in our data, uh, because we understood the, student, the standards better, and we were able to tell quickly what students were lacking or what we could grow on. Um, and that is one thing that I saw twice in two different areas in there that I think is huge. That's something that would take us probably another two years as a curriculum mapping mm -hmm. team to get in there. Um, the assessments is another thing we were talking about adding that this summer. So you're probably talking about three years that it would have taken us to do what they've already done for us. I think that's phenomenal. Well, I'm, I'm agreeing with you 100%. And I'm, I'm agreeing that them doing the work is wonderful. I mean, we're making out on that. I'm simply it. trying to advise people. Yeah. Be aware this can turn into cookie cutter teaching. Mm -hmm. you, what you're intending to do today, over time, may degenerate. And that's all I'm saying. I'm just saying be aware of it. Mm -hmm. Just as a comment, um, one side. Um, after we had our admin team pre presentation, and then I, once I heard the framing of, you know, a teacher sits down and says, okay, we're ready to teach these standards via this novel, 
we're not necessarily changing that, but I'm going to look in this system and say, okay, well, what we used in the past, are we at the right DLK level? Are we even in the right area? And it gives, it, it just, it, it's all in one place. Because I'll say it at Thunderbolt, teachers are going out and getting their own things because that's what they have to do. And then it's, Connie may think this is a different level than Andrea, et cetera. So to have the opportunity to say, we're, we know because this has been vetted, to take what we've been doing even and then kind of run it through and see where are we at. Are we okay? Awesome. We're going to upload it and we're going to keep them or ooh, maybe we need to up the rigor or or maybe lower, I don't, you know, different things, but, so, and then I, and then the planning thing, I think, once we've seen it like this, Shannon, like you said, I, I just think it's going to make a huge difference for teachers to be able to go one place. Um, and then I would say feedback that I've had over the years from my new teachers is, yeah, well, all this stuff is everywhere, but it's overwhelming. Yeah. It's overwhelming. And so I don't even know, mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it um, for my teachers, really. And I've used a system similar all. called Beyond Textbooks. I would only recommend using the pacing guide because I can tell you right now the standard in ELA that Shannon's teaching over at Starline is not the same one I'm teaching over at Havasupai. And if their pacing guide does it like Beyond Textbooks, it maps it. So this week you're teaching this standard for this many days. This week you're teaching this standard for this many days. That way all of our schools are teaching the same standard at the same time. So then when our transient kids do move from school to school, they're not missing anything or relearning something that they've already done. Because our pacing guide just tells us what to teach in a quarter. I can teach them in any order at any time. Or I would yeah. say though that my thing, we're still teaching kids. So at my school it may take Longer. And, and that's you what I'm on Tuesday, I'm teaching this, and my kids aren't ready. Right, and you can move on quicker. It just gives a recommendation of, like it said, suggested 10 days. You may not need that full 10 days. I, I would, but yeah. Our units lessons have that on there, though. There are durations on there. Yeah. You know. Right, but we're not set up to all teach at the same, the same standard around the same time. No. It depends if you're following the, map, the, the units and lessons. If you're doing the... Like there's, yeah. there's the other. Yeah. Well, if no, you're doing yeah. that, we have our pacing guides, but we have also created units and lessons for each quarter. And if you're going along the units and lessons, then we should be pretty much in the same Can place. I interject a second? This is a transition year, and that's the whole point. Is we yeah. need to sit down as a group over the course of the year and look at our resources and then align things and say, okay, this is where we need to focus on the standard, and this is when it should be taught, and we all agree. Yeah. I think going, like, the big thing that I see is everything's in one place. And I've been out of the classroom five years, I'm going back in the classroom, so that excites me. My concern is, has anybody tried the links, has everything, I mean, this is the first year it's vetted, but nobody I've talked to has ever really gone in. And I know at the articulation meeting I went to, we talked about it, I know Corey said it's not something that we are going to have to use but to try and get it, but we couldn't even get on to do anything with to experience it. That's so my concern right. is, is we're doing, getting, purchasing something before we know is everything working and who do we have support for it if it, things are not. Yeah, that's that's part of our agreement. They provide support so does ATI. Okay. So we have somebody there available 24-7. I think it will be critical to which everybody has said, but that this year teachers know this is year one. So it's not a you must do this by this time. It's just, hey, this is year one, and we're going to see where we, like Brad said, we're going to see where we're at, what adjustments we can make. I think that will take some worry away from the teachers. Yeah, it's a resource. It's a resource to you. And then it's not something to follow. Yeah. And that the principals are all on the same page with that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And all of those have a lot of materials. Like, I know we have our phonics program and our reading program, but a lot of that stuff, if we wanted to make it the correct rigor and up to those standards, that's where a lot of the supplementing comes in because I have to bring in this because now in the kindergarten I'm teaching 
all of these things and I need extra resources that aren't covered in some of our things. So that's I think where a lot of people are concerned too is like is this it is a resource, it gives us more information, but is it giving us like more materials to like, yeah, that's great, I'd love to teach that with it, but I have to like create or find something to like put it all together. Here here's what I think the cool part of that is. It's a platform. It's all it is. Yes. Yep. Anything above the platform is you. So if you like this resource or you like this extra little piece over here that you want to bring into it as the individual teacher, it doesn't take your individuality away. And, 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 and when you get into teaching, it's the individuality of the teacher that I think is important. The teachers bring something and you can't just simply say, we're going to teach you math. And this is how we're going to teach you math. If we don't teach you math this way, you're never going to learn it because you're just too dumb to learn math. You, you, you've got to have a teacher that says, well, maybe you don't learn this way. Maybe I have to do it this way. Maybe I have to go back to flashcards and memorization and the way I was taught math. In fact, when I was told this is the way you will learn math, you're dumb. Um, but, I, but I think it, it allows you to have the flexibility as a teacher. And it builds us into a standard that will get the child to what the desired outcome is. And that is getting through those testing points and getting to proficiency in the standard. And I think as long as it does that, I don't see a problem. But the danger is, is that sometimes, which was what Mr. Ward's point was, sometimes when we build that framework, that platform, sometimes we build too much platform. And, and the trick here is getting the balancing act right to where we are empowering the teacher based on what we're doing to hit the standard and not forcing them into this is the only way to hit the standard. As long as we do those things, I, it's, it's a good program and it's a winner. If we can approach one way or the other too high or too low, we're going to miss the mark. And I like, I like the way this lays out. I like the way that, that the dashboard looks. I think, I think that uh, what I've written here the presentation, I'm very comfortable with it. I think, I think the other thing I like is I'm watching everybody out here talk as a staff. And it's nice to see you excited about teaching. We're not talking about salaries, we're not talking about benefits, we're talking <laughs> about teaching. And that's a, that to me is the biggest bonus for tonight. If you do vote on this, how soon will we be able to get our hands on it? Five, six years tops. Vacation <laughs> well, the ended yesterday. I need it tomorrow. <laughs> Brad, um, you have an answer. Depending on the answer, <laughs> that's the question. Um, I, I will visit with Mike uh, from Crane after this evening, tomorrow morning. I will say, okay, what's the next step? Because he will provide the training on the navigation of the, the platform for our staff. Andrea. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add, Kelsey's point um, also had to do with resources. What we, we were able to kind of see a little bit of a presentation from the Crane staff on what it did look like. And though all the units do look differently and the resources, the connected resources may look different, there were specific units that, that did have a connected link to a specific resource that had been vetted that you could look at. I mean, so for example, if you guys, I mean, we all know how much money everybody spends on Pinterest, right? But we don't all know how, what the quality of the lessons are going to be. They've taken the opportunity to go through and look through a lot of those resources that may look similar to what we already have in our classrooms, but they've picked and chose, chosen the ones that really do meet that rigor level that we need. So there may not be one specific for every single unit, but there are, just so you know, okay. there are some additional resources. Well, part part like going and finding that. And then there was like, yeah. there was that's even um, videos, like she said, one like mm -hmm. videos, presentations of how that lesson might look in the classroom. Mm -hmm. like and that when we great. add to it, as far as like you were saying, we're going to be able to add to it. Is that yes. any one person adding to it, or is it giving us rights? To um, that's what we'll talk about. Yeah. Okay. We'll have our own platform on this, in the same area for our, our material. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and call for the vote. I think we've had tons of discussion. <laughs> We're having fun. We have some fun. John Bassett? Yes. Alan Ward? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Okay, so, item 6.6, .6, approval of the 
renewal of quality first child care scholarships provider agreement between Lake between Valley of the Sun United Way and Lake Havasu Unified School District Little Knights and Smoke Tree Preschools. Mrs. Walter. Madam President, members of the board, it is recommended the board approve the Quality First Child Care Scholarship Program provider agreements between Valley of the Sun United Way and Lake Havasu Unified School District Little Knights and Smoke Tree Developmental Preschools. The Cavs Unified School District Governing Board has previously given approval for the participation in the community pre-kindergarten programs through First Things First. Valley of the Sun United Way is the direct recipient of the First Things First funding, and annual preschool scholarships are awarded through the First Things First Quality First VA United Way to participate in the eligible programs. Pending approval, this agreement will be in effect as of July 1, 2017 through June 30, 2018 with consecutive yearly renewal options pending on quality first star rating and available first things first funding. This has been reviewed by legal. Thank you. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Any questions? Discussion? Are there any parent co-pays involved in this at all, or do we basically provide everything? We provide everything. <coughs> Mark Joe, call for the vote. Captain Heath? Yes. Captain Warren? Yes. Joe Gaston? Yes. Joe Yes. And 6.7, uh, approval of student activity funds and auxiliary funds. Mr. Murray. Madam President, members of the board, it's recommended that the board approve the student activity funds for K-8 for May 2017 in the amount of $31,880.84 and the student activity funds for 9 through 12 for May 2017 in the amount of $214,677.41. The auxiliary funds for May of 2017 were, were $842,114.87. Thank you. Do I have a motion? So I'm moved. Motion we pass it as the second. Any questions? <laughs> Martha Joe. Randy? Yes. Alan Ward? Yes. John Baston? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Okay, informational section. This is a sire. Don't really have much to say except congratulations on your first board meeting in the 2017-18 school year. <laughs> we are now in it. <laughs> Anything from the directors? Anything from the board members? I just wanted to um, say congratulations to Mrs. Sire for completing her first year as our superintendent. <laughs> and thank all the directors for making this uh, budget process so enjoyable this year. Thank you very much. Any calls to the public? Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. Jeff? John Gaston? Yes. Nicole Yes. Someday just for fun, I'm going to say no. <laughs> <laughs>